My guest today is a partner at an investment bank that he co-founded. Uh, the last interview I did with an investment banker was quite popular, so I'm looking forward to this one. Um, I'm joined in the Defiant studio by Chris Shipferling of Global Wired Advisors. Chris, thanks for joining me today. Did I say the name correctly? You did. You nailed it. It's awesome. One awesome. of the few. <laughs> It'll be one of the few things I nailed today, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so can you uh, tell the listeners what Global Wired is, what you do for a living? Yeah, absolutely. We are a, a lower middle market investment bank uh, focused on consumer products with a heavier concentration in e-commerce. So, um, you know, we uh, we started this investment bank roughly three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get into careers a little bit later, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we uh, knew that there was a, a large void in white space to focus on growing um, businesses that were on marketplaces, mm -hmm. um, growing direct to consumer businesses that, um, frankly speaking, in the consumer products world tends to get uh, ignored. They're too small. Mm -hmm. at least three, four, five years ago. And now as they were growing, we saw a need to bring professional services like, you know, investment banking into this space that is just littered with business brokers. So, so I'm familiar with, with Harris Williams. I've, I've done a few uh, transactions or some business with, with Hyder Harris and, and we hired them to sell a firm that I was involved with uh, uh, probably about a decade ago. And they really, they, they, they market themselves as welcome to the middle. They're the mid market, yeah. but what they define as the mid market doesn't seem very middle to me. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what, for you, what, what do you guys define as lower middle market? Yeah, it's pretty traditional, um, in the sense of how we tear it out. So you've got your main street guys, which for us is, is typically EBITDA. Uh, we, we only speak in EBITDA. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, roughly a million, million and a half or mm -hmm. below um, is where we kind of consider Main Street. Lower middle market, and you can really define it almost as lower, lower middle market, mm -hmm. is kind of that one, five to call it three, four million EBITDA. And then you've got the lower, true lower middle market where it's like the three to four upwards to about 10, 11. Then you're starting to get into EBITDA ranges that are the true middle market, mm -hmm. um, roughly over 10 million. So, very interesting. Yeah. And, and you said you started it about about three years ago. What what were you doing at the time? Yeah, actually, at that time, I was a consultant. Um, so, you know, I spent uh, majority of my career working in consumer products as a sales and marketing executive. And then around roughly 2016, I pivoted my career uh, to go purely digital. Um, mm -hmm. I was so sick and tired of hearing about buyer's opinions at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, <laughs> Target and Walmart, and you're dealing with a lot of subjectivity, a mm -hmm. lot of gut. And uh, I was just tired of hearing what they had to say. I wanted to go find out what the consumer had to say. Um, and so at that time, I pivoted my career to purely digital. I learned Amazon Seller Central back and forth. Uh, there's no executive course that you take at uh, NYU or. So, so what is Amazon Seller Central for the for the yeah. listeners? Who, you can probably guess. I could probably guess what it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's really two two sides to Amazon. There's Amazon Vendor Central, which mm -hmm. uh, Vendor Central is where you sell to them at wholesale pricing, just to make it really easy. Mm -hmm. Seller Central is their marketplace. Um, so you have a widget and you think the widget is good, you want to sell that widget to lots and lots of consumers, you get on Seller Central and you start selling. So just to make sure I have this right, because I, I could try to go the more traditional route with Amazon where because they manage their own storefront and I could try to get one of their buyers to mm -hmm. buy my product. I take it this one, they're not buying the product. Is it more of a consignment setup? And I'm <laughs> responsible for, I, I can put, I can get shelf space there, yes. so, to, so to speak. <clears throat> That's right. It's, it's a pure marketplace model. You know, you set up your own listing, you optimize your own listing, you're controlling the advertising uh, portal, you know, you're, you're doing it all. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a one-stop shop for you to sell on that marketplace. Vendor Central, if you're not, if you aren't Nike or mm -hmm. Reebok or Patagonia, <laughs> you're not going to have a shot. Got like it. They're just, they're just throwing everybody now to seller central. And so that really started happening around 2014, 15. You saw mm -hmm. what we call the FBA gold rush fulfillment by Amazon mm -hmm. um, gold rush of a lot of sellers getting on the platform to sell their product. And so it was around that time that I really just, I buckled down. I learned seller central. I also learned just digital marketing theory. Mm -hmm. um, and you were doing this as a consultant. Were you doing this for 
customers, companies that want to sell their products on Seller Central? At the time, I was actually still working for somebody. So I was doing it for that company. And then I realized very quickly, I could do this for other folks. And Mm -hmm. I could make a lot more money doing that Mm -hmm. (laughs) as a consultant than I could on a W-2. Sure. And so that's really when I pivoted my career. And so prior to starting Global Wired Advisors, I was a a really a consult a digital a digital consultant helping small you know SMBs small to medium sized businesses as well as some enterprise clients just create a digital strategy because you have a lot of antiquated consumer product companies that are out there that traditional wholesale and traditional mm-hmm. distribution and I sell to Target and I sell to Walmart. So would, would an example of traditional versus more modern or digital be like Gillette versus Harry's? Yeah. Okay. Great example. Yeah. So. Gillette, lots of, you know, sales R&D teams, and- yeah, <laughs> going out there to Walmart buying team. And Harry's is like, yeah, I don't need any of those guys. I just want to talk directly to I'm going to get a video. At, hopefully it goes viral. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so interestingly yeah. enough, Harry's is actually now in Target. I don't know if you saw that. I did see that yeah. recently. No, I, I literally was in the, the Midtown Target uh, this this past weekend and I saw Harry's and I was like, that's interesting. Who, who <laughs> bought Harry's? It was a, a traditional CPG brand, right? I, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I actually do know a guy who started his own direct to consumer business. That was one of the growth marketing guys at Harry's mm-hmm. and his business is wild. He got into a category that he's never been into before. Mm-hmm. And it's just because he was the growth marketing guy at Harry's, that business is wildly successful. Well, and, so. and that that seems like the real key to these businesses is find a product that's good enough. It, it's got some advantage. In Harry's case, it's why are you spending so much money on razors when half the time they're broken mm-hmm. and, and you forget to get them? We'll just ship them to you. They don't need to be the latest and greatest. That's they right. just need to be good enough. But it's more about that marketing. How do I get that viral buzz? How do I get in front of buyers? I'm not worried about shelf space anymore. I'm worried about how do I get in front of you on Instagram? How do I get in front of you on TikTok? How do I, it's really that digital marketing. Give me the first handshake. Mm -hmm. Let me not just give out coupons to go to Costco. Yep. That's awesome. Give me the first Mm -hmm. handshake. That's right. What, so how how many partners do you have in the business? Yeah. So there's uh, four total, including myself. Okay. Uh, Yeah. And what, what were the other, what were the other guys doing? Yeah. Completely different careers. So which really kind of makes Global Wired very special. So we really lead with business development. We lead with marketing, almost like you would in a traditional consumer products business. Um, Their prior lives were all the bulge bracket investment banks. So they were working for Wells Fargo and Deutsche Bank and A&B and Bayview Asset Management, Bank of America, you know, Citigroup, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they came from that large bulge bracket investment banking, big financial engineering careers, working on very large, complex, you know, transactions. Um, and then at, at any given time, from about 2012 to about 2006, 15, they left and started their own businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually met together prior to Global Wired Advisors and started another um, uh, investment bank called Providium Advisors focused on traditional businesses. And so, you know, they already had that firm when I met them. Um, and when we met, we said, okay, here's where consumer products is going from a digital perspective. Okay, here's the, here's the runway. You've got the financial engineering background. I've got the CPG. Let's put this thing together. I think we've got something special. That's awesome. How did you guys know each other before? Uh, actually, a local uh, digital marketing agency here in town called the agency um, shout out to them up in Noda. Shout out to the agency. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, they actually connected us. So they, so, uh, oh, wow. two of my partners, uh, they have an investment out in Oregon. It's a, a supply business, cannabis supply company mm-hmm. out in Southern Oregon. And so they, uh, they hired or engaged with the agency to do some work. I was doing some consultancy at the time around Amazon. They needed some Amazon consultancy work. So they linked us up and then one thing led to another. And we said, Hey, let's forget everything we're doing here. We think we've got some over here. That's great. Was, yeah. was I mean, how does that conversation start? Obviously, you're looking at problems together, and then you say, "But, but, how does the conversation start?" That hey, why don't we just go into business and 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 create a bank? Yeah, great question. So when when we first had breakfast, I actually had breakfast with uh, with my partner Jason. And we just, we just almost hit it off right away. I mean, you know, when you meet some folks. It's a bromance. It's just, it was. It was an immediate bromance, right? Uh, he's going to feel weird when he listens to this, I'm if, sure. But uh, Jason, if it makes you feel any better, my business partner, Tarek, and I, it was an instant bromance. It's too. instant <laughs> bromance. And so we had breakfast. And, and actually, at the time, I knew someone who was, who was interviewing different banks and even some business brokers. 
um, to sell his business. It was a really nice direct to consumer stroller company. Mm -hmm. And so I actually, we, we were started talking about, you know, this investment out in Oregon. And then I said, Hey, what do you, what's this providium thing? And he mm -hmm. told me about it, you know, investment bank for small businesses, basically bringing wall street to main street, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. I said, I have somebody to introduce you to. And so I introduced him. They actually engaged with, uh, this contact and then almost right away, because this, this was a purely digital business. It was an e-commerce business that I introduced them to. And then about three weeks later, you know, we had some different conversations about, you know, uh, the investment out in Oregon, what we were doing with the Amazon stuff. And then about three weeks later, he texted me and said, I have an idea. And I turned to my wife and I was like, if an investment banker has an idea, you should <laughs> always listen because there's been a lot of thought put behind that. So we actually met at uh, Brakeman's Coffee Shop in Matthews. Okay. And we sat there for about two hours and he just walked me through uh, a thesis of, hey, here's where we believe things are going in this particular ecosystem. It's interesting. Investment bankers do tend to think that way. Where are the big trends? Where is the big right. smart money lining up? Whereas operators might think more, how do I just make money to, today? Right? That's right. It's more, it's, it's, it's more tactical and less strategic. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, he, he kind of walked me through his thesis and backed it up with some, I would, I would call really good uh, detail and, and evidence of mm -hmm. why he believes this is going to be a really good thing. And I, I met the other partners and one thing led to another. We started having conversations about how we would formulate this whole thing. And then voila, was there a single aha moment when you're like, yeah, we're fucking doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. They actually, they had an aha moment and they brought that aha moment to me. And then I had the aha moment, right? Yeah. Um, they passed the aha joint around the, <laughs> around the room. And so the, the aha moment they had was, oh my gosh, there are real businesses that are getting traded and they're being sold by just terrible business brokers. Mm -hmm. These guys were selling cars two weeks ago yeah. and now they're selling businesses. Why? That makes no sense. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there is a place for business brokers, right? Like if I'm selling a family owned business to somebody who wants a family owned business or a lifestyle business to another lifestyle business, but, but that's, I, I think investment banks are a completely different thing than a business broker. hundred yeah. percent. And so that's where we saw the opportunity where we said, wait a minute, we can really bring, career experience, we can bring sophistication. Mm -hmm. I just keep going down the list. We can bring a completely different process to this side of the capital markets that's growing and thriving. We'll get into COVID in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and really get a more optimal trade for a small business. Yeah. So They're very cool. And 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 I've seen it in many different businesses where um, just if you can afford an investment banker it, it can work. There are other businesses where I don't think investment banking is yet a good fit. I think raising early stage capital is sometimes tough for a lot of businesses, depending on the amount we would that, agree. You're, that you're raising. We would a hundred percent agree. Yeah. But, but, but I do think that if you can get to the scale where you can attract the attention of an investment banker, yeah. um, there, there, there are just things that can be done in ways that the story can be told and framed and access to, to, to buyers. Um, so, so that, that, that's really interesting. Um, how, how did you guys go about getting your first client? Uh, great question. Um, cold email, man. We just went out there and just, <laughs> we, we bought a list and we, we went out and just hit a lot of inboxes. So, so what is the messaging in this, in this email? Uh, yeah. I'm fascinated by this. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And we got a lot of heads to turn. We just, I don't know, I don't know how else to say this. It, it sounds arrogant, but we just sounded smarter. You know, instead of just going out there saying, hey, you have a business, we want to sell it, you can make lots of money or doing the, you know, mm -hmm. the typical, you know, kind of car salesman thing. It was, you know, speaking to their business and to them, kind of meeting them where we thought they were at and speaking about their business very intelligently and kind of doing more of an analysis of mm -hmm. where they are, analysis of the market and where they could potentially trade um, just given, you know, where the market is today. Interesting. So do you, did you go out and look at a kind of define a persona or the, the people that you want to reach and write a, an, an email template that, that maps to them? Or was it literally as customized as each individual person that you're reaching out to you? you, you tell oh, no, man, it stories. was, it was, it was as, uh, I mean, it was just a list and we just sent it out. Yep. You know, it was just the, the early days of rolling up your sleeves and it's just like, all right, man, I'm sending out 10,000 emails. Let's see what happens. And so, 
Yeah, we got really good response. And that's really where our first wave of clients came from. I mean, so, obviously, they responded and we talked to them and yeah. et cetera. So. So, so, you, so you get your first client. Yeah. Were the next few any easier? Or it sounds like you lumped the first handful together into one. So I'm, I'm guessing they were all about the same. They came out of the same marketing effort. They did. And then we just, we had to continue to graduate our marketing effort, right? So you can't mm -hmm. just, you can just do cold email marketing forever. We started building really good partnerships with um, different folks within the ecosystem. Um, you know, a bunch of Amazon consultants, consultants, mm -hmm. consultants, and Amazon consulting agencies, some digital marketing agencies, you know, kind of expanding our branches out a little bit just to graduate our marketing. Geographically, are they, are these companies completely dispersed? Are they located in certain geographies? Everywhere. Or? Everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, they should be. Right? I'm yeah. talking to a guy right now who is um, from Tel Aviv, but he's living in the Philippines. And you know, he's grown a very successful Amazon business. They have close to $4 million of EBITDA, living, wow. living his best life, you know. <laughs> Good and we just closed a business in September from the UK. And, you know, the folks I was telling you about earlier that I spoke to, they're in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. You know, we saw one business in Charlotte. <laughs> but, and, and, and that's the beauty of the Amazon business model. It is. And, and, and not just on, um, on, on your side of it around the, the consumer products and selling direct to consumer, but on, in my world, um, Amazon and public cloud has enabled all sorts mm -hmm. of changes to where you don't need an army of developers sitting in one location building that's software. Right. It can be just that's completely right. globally distributed. That's right. Yeah. That is the beauty. That's the beauty of D2C, D to, D to so mm -hmm. direct to consumer Amazon uh, businesses, just marketplace businesses in general. You can sit anywhere. You can sit in Tahiti and, and, and get online. I mean, there's a lot of folks that we that we work with a lot of clients. It's funny because I always used to make fun of the four hour work week. I love that book, by the way. I've never built a business like that, but I'm fascinated by Same. it. Same. <laughs> I used to make fun of it. I'm like, ah, this isn't real. Like people just can't have businesses yeah. where they work four hours. We work with a decent amount of clients who not only subscribe to it, but actually do it. You know, one of the, the, the business that I was just saying, the guy in the, the Philippines, mm -hmm. he told me I work four hours a week and I'm like, <laughs> wow. All right, man. Good. I'm envious. Good for him. If you haven't <laughs> read the four hour work week, I think it's, it is very instructive. I, it, I'd, I'd probably find it hard to build that kind of business given my own background, but I, That's like right. I did, I started writing down ideas when I read it of like, these are the kind of business. It's inspiring. Yeah. yeah it's really it is cool. inspiring. I think the principle of it, which is just like, Hey, try and get to a place where you can, you know, time is very valuable. Treat yep. it that way. Right. Don't just be a slave to your work, but really enjoy your work. Well, outsource everything. So yes. the first thing you're outsourcing and what I'm hearing from you is the fulfillment. Let Amazon fulfill it. That's right. Fulfillment's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> Having a warehouse and bringing yeah. product in, accepting in product and all that stuff and returns and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And even your customer service is outsourced on Amazon Yep. when you do FBA. So, wow. I mean, you know, you're just a, you could be a guy in Tahiti making, or excuse me, Philippines, $4 yeah. million dollars of EBITDA <laughs> a year and just, you know, Wow. Four hours a week. Yeah. Wow. So how much more sophisticated has your deal sourcing gotten these days, three years later? Yeah, a <laughs> lot more. <laughs> we still, we have a lot of different efforts and, and, you know, it was really, it was a shame because pre COVID we had a huge plan to go out to lots of conferences and start doing a lot of speaking and, you know, meeting lots of people face to face and et cetera. That changed? Yeah, just a little bit, just slightly. We went, no one else did. It got really weird. It just showed up to a lot of empty rooms. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's changed significantly. This year, going into this year, once things start to open up, mm -hmm. our first conference, I believe, is going to be in July. Okay, and where so, is that? Uh, Vegas. Yeah, it's oh, called the Prop. The, I know, it's a <laughs> terrible place to go. I mean, terrible, terrible place. But um, so, yeah, that's going to be our first conference. And we have several conferences. I mean, everything is, there's so much, you know, pulled, pull forward demand. I feel like that business is just going, th there's a handful of businesses where nothing could get done. And now all of a sudden there's a backlog. It's just, <laughs> uh, we, our back half is just stupid, like stupid, stupid. I, so. I talked to a gym owner and he, he was able to create a, um, during COVID, he was able to create a remote experience where he only lost 3% of his revenue. But he said the minute the gyms op reopened, it was even more than January. Like yeah. normally in January, everybody's like, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta Everything. get into the gym. But he, he just, he, he said that his 50% uh, increase in one month when, when they reopen. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, man. There's still, and travel is the other place. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of pull forward demand. Yeah. You know, once things really open up, you're going to see it. I mean, flights, hotels, everything is just going to be completely booked. Yeah. So, yep. 
So um, how do you see your deal sourcing process evolving? So you're obviously you're going to get back to going to conferences, yeah. but how does that change? Uh, do, do you think, do you, do, are you going to start going after bigger clients? Do you think, or is it more of the same clients or, and, and, and then does that change the, the way that you go after finding new clients? Yeah. Good question. You know, we're, we've got a pretty defined criteria. So we really like to work with, with, uh, with top quartile businesses within a specific category in the lower middle market between one to one and a half million dollars of EBITDA to 10. That's mm -hmm. really kind of our criteria. So as far as kind of deal sourcing and going after new clients and how we will do that, you know, the next iteration, uh, we actually just hired a VP of equity research. Um, we took him from Citigroup. Mm -hmm. And so he was doing all the um, equity research for about 20 public stocks for e-com. Okay. And so really getting him to work, which is just doing a bunch of research within this space that, that, it, that doesn't exist mm -hmm. at all, you know? And so is this research finding companies that you may want to represent on the buy or the sell side, or is this doing research that's useful to companies that you may it's represent do, on it's the buy and sell side? Great quote, both. Yeah. And it's, okay. it's, you know, it's doing research within a space where <clears throat> research right now is just so anemic mm -hmm. or it doesn't exist. And so just bringing anything to the table and making it really intelligent mm -hmm. will just put us into a, in my opinion, another league, mm -hmm. um, into another class, right? Yep. We're, we're trying to, cre we're trying to move the market. We're trying to, we're trying to create a market that in some ways is very, very immature at the moment, uh, and try and bring maturity to the market. So, I mean, when, when you mentioned 2014 is, I think you said 2014 is when Amazon brought this product for themselves, but was there a, a market before Amazon created this or did they just make it, were, were they the 10X improvement in the market? Yeah. I mean, look, it was around 2000, it was more like 2008, 2009, okay. I think when, when Seller Central was created, I'm oh, probably getting it. my okay. dates wrong, but with that said, it wasn't until about 14, 15 got that it. you saw a gold rush okay. is what we call it. Yeah of just lots of sellers going to Seller Central. Um, That's interesting. They started it in 08, 09, because I think 06 was when they officially turned on AWS, which yeah. is, is is the game changer in my industry. But it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't until like 15, 16 that I started seeing businesses in, in our space start to crop up around, we'll yeah. bring you to Amazon. And now we, at Defiance, we have a, a, a managed service offering that we sell to clients where we'll just manage your Amazon infrastructure for you. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. Well, you know, to that point, <clears throat> you know, when you're really looking at kind of the, uh, the different groups within Amazon that makes money, AWS is always typically number one. Yep. Um, seller central's number two vendors, okay. vendor central is actually number three. Okay. Because seller central, what about their logistics business? Do you touch that much? I know that they bought a fleet of jets and I, and you see their trucks driving around because they were literally crushing USPS, right. UPS and FedEx. So. That's, that's really to prop up. So they took a lot of profits from AWS and mm -hmm. they, they just continue to reinvest in infrastructure. And so that whole logistics kind of build up has been to support seller central. Okay. And to make, to make it where they're 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 creeping up the costs, right? <laughs> to to the to the sellers. I've heard it called the Amazon tax. Yeah, <laughs> they're literally <laughs> charging a tax on every transaction on the internet at this point. They are. Yeah, yeah. that's a whole uh, that's a whole other podcast. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's really to prop up the seller central effort. Okay. Um, and to make it to where, because for a while I think it was either a loss or break even, mm -hmm. and so by building up the the logistics side and that infrastructure what they're now charging customers, they're actually making money. They're going to eventually mm -hmm. make money on that. But I think, gosh, I read a stat recently. It's like 45% of deliveries now for e -com, I think is done by Amazon, something like that. I believe it. I see their trucks or maybe it's everywhere. like yeah. 60, per, I'm sorry, maybe it's on, on amazon.com alone. It's like, it's like around 60% of wow. the deliveries where before it was always USPS or UPS yep. or FedEx. Now it's majority done by their own drivers, but, and it's not, by the way, more sophisticated. But, well, and it's not like UPS and uh, UPS and USPS aren't still doing this stuff. They're doing it. They just can't they keep are. up with the pace. They are. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, what's so interesting. So Shopify has grown significantly through the pandemic and there's been a lot of rumor that, uh, that I've heard here and there of, of FedEx actually buying Shopify, which would mm -hmm. make sense because then, you know, they've mm -hmm. got the same type of kind of 
model as Amazon Seller Central in some ways. That, that's so. really interesting. I was going to ask, do you get into much Shopify or yes. some, some of the other players in this space? I guess people are selling on Etsy or yeah. people sell direct on Instagram. Is, is that... Do, do you get involved in those type of direct to consumer businesses yes. or is Amazon easier to pick off for some it, It's all the above. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we, ha we've got clients that might be, we actually have a client, um, coming on board very soon, a hundred percent Shopify, mm -hmm. and then we'll have another client, 100% Amazon. So for us, it's really about consumer products mm -hmm. and it's about, you know, doesn't really matter where their, where their revenue concentration is going for us. It's consumer products who are focused on e-com. So whether that's a Amazon, whether that's Shopify, we have clients who use big commerce. We have a client who uses Volusion. God bless them. I did a I did a project for Volusion in Austin where I was helping them <laughs> with some technology in the early level days, and I had never heard of Volusion. <laughs> As we say in the South, bless their heart. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it it seemed that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised to hear that. So I want I want you to walk me through, yeah. um, because I, I ask all of my guests this. Um, Walk me through how you and your partners are talking in February of 2020. Yeah. And then maybe March of 2020. Yeah. Okay. Great question. <laughs> February, we were talking about uh, hitting up a lot of conferences. We were talking about really going hard after, um, you know, we talked a lot about hiring during that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we were very, uh, very ambitious around where we would speak who we would speak to. And then March of 2020 hit and it was a big old fat question mark. Yeah. It genuinely was, it was almost like a, okay, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know, we were smart fiscally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we knew that no matter where things went, we weren't going to get, you know, caught with our quote pants down unquote. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it but was you're not like, going to go hire eight analysts. <laughs> that's right. We weren't going to go. Exactly. We were like, okay, let's put that on hold. Let's put everything on hold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had active deals. We actually had a deal close during the pandemic. And we were nervous about that. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of we, the, the, the gentleman who was buying the business uh, was a billionaire mm -hmm. and mainly wrapped up in stock. And every $10 the stock went down in March his net worth went down 300 million. That's a good problem to have though. Let's be honest. It's a wonderful <laughs> problem to have. Right. But at the same time, we're like, yeah, Oh my God, like, yeah. what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And so it was a really precarious time. Yeah. Very well, precarious. That's probably the best way to put it. So, so, so you're watching in March, you're seeing how things are happening. When do you start to feel a little bit better about, okay, we can, the world isn't ending. We're, we're, we're going to, get back on a growth track or get back to normal. How, how long do you think it was uh, before you started thinking that? Way? April. April. Wow. Yeah. End of <laughs> April, because we had active clients, right? We have active engagements and we're watching all of their metrics mm -hmm. and their sales are just, their growth trajectory went insane Yeah, because everybody was staying home. And so for us in consumer products, what's the thing they were doing? They were going online and they were purchasing things for their home. Um, toilet paper, hopefully. Uh, yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of toilet paper. Um, but they were purchasing things for... I, and in the SB household, I was purchasing wine. But yeah. <laughs> in the Shipferling household, it was about the same. So, uh, But yeah, so they went online and they were doing a lot of purchasing. And I mean, you know, just some stats for that, just kind of through COVID, I believe there was close to 7 million new digital buyers. And a lot of them were in the baby boomers, okay. you know, demographic. And they have the most discretionary income, mm -hmm. right? And so they never shopped online, but they were forced to. So now they're starting to buy online. And McKinsey actually put out a stat. I think the the pull forward, the pull forward demand and just kind of sales on through e-commerce just fast forwarded, I believe, ten years through the summer of last year. It's in it's wow. insane. Wow. Yeah. So, it, well, I, I feel like with a company like Zoom, probably a similar statistic, mm -hmm. right? It's just that my, my fucking kids are on Zoom like yeah, for school. Like, I know. Th that would have never happened I without know. this. It's, uh, it's, yeah. cr it's crazy. My, my favorite thing, though, my favorite story about the pandemic and Zoom was when everyone wanted to go buy Zoom stock mm -hmm. because everyone was flocking mm -hmm. there, but they got it confused with the penny stock. I heard that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite Zoom story. So, <laughs> so how about your job function? Like, mm -hmm. what's what's changed in your job function during this COVID pandemic? I mean, you you mentioned that you were 
going to a lot of conferences. Yeah. You're probably going and meeting a lot of people. Yeah. Um, how, how does that change as, as things are locked down and travel is, is non-existent? Yeah, I mean, the, the good news in our space is you have a lot of uh, clients and potential clients that are used to doing lots of things remote, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were comfortable with, you know, taking Zoom meetings. They were comfortable taking phone meetings. They were comfortable never actually meeting us face to face even prior to the pandemic and becoming well, a client. Well, their four hour work week in Philippines. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so yeah, how, how did it change? You know, we, we, we gained a lot of new partnerships. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I went on kind of a, a big spree of just getting to know a lot of, lot more folks within the ecosystem last year mm -hmm. and really building those relationships, referral relationships, partnerships where I could send, um, you know, potential clients for us I could actually send them to these potential, you know, partners, et cetera. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, we just, we ramped up some of our other digital marketing efforts. Yep. Um, you know, cause when you get rid of anything to do with face to face, it's like, okay, well let's at reallocate our budget over here yep. and let's just ramp it up as much as possible. But the good news is at least in our space, you saw a lot of folks who are looking at their metrics and going, oh my gosh, I'm selling more than I've ever sold in my life it's time for me to sell. It's time for me to cash out. I don't think I'll, I don't think I can do better than this. You know, cause you have a lot of first generation mm -hmm. owners. And so that's kind of the good news for us. We actually saw a little bit, a little bit of a organic. They, they want to take chips off the table they so do. that they can regroup in a couple of years. That's and right. Do the next big thing. That's right. Yeah. And for, again, for a lot of them, they're like, you know, they were cruising for two, three years, you know, growth trajectory, five, 10, 15, 20% per year. And then COVID hits it's a hundred percent. Wow. And they're going, yeah, I'll never do as good as this. Yeah. You know, I got massive tailwind. It's time for me to cash out. So we, we got a little bit of a, or kind of an organic lift through that. So. so do you spend more time, or maybe it's not even spend more time, but what do you prefer, representing buy side or sell side? And I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and give it. <laughs> sell side, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, and why is that? Because everybody that I talk to unanimously says, I mean, they don't even have to think about it. Yeah. And, and my, my fiance is in um, real estate and she prefers dramatically sell side. Um, yeah. But I pointed out to her, well, every time you do a buy side, you have a sell side. So treat the buy side as, but that's a different dynamic than what you're dealing it with. It is. Right? And, and we, <laughs> it is very much so. We just, uh, you know, we, we've, we've actually been approached two times by, two fairly well-known private equity firms mm -hmm. to help them with some of the, with one of their portfolio, both one of their portfolio companies look for uh, e-commerce targets and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And it's just not nearly as fun as, as, you know, meeting a guy like you and learning about your business and, you know, hearing that you started this in your garage and then all of us, you know, you may have mortgaged your home to, for payroll and like that blood, sweat and tears. Mm -hmm. And then being able to represent you and help you sell your company. That's and more fun than hanging out with a bunch of private equity dudes who have raised money from other people. I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> I'm going to let you take that one. Yeah. So, so I, you know, God love the private equity people, but I suspect that's not a fun conversation to have because everything is squeezing every dollar out of everything. Oh, it's, it's arduous. It's, yeah. it, it's arduous, but it's, it's way but, more. But I think there's another dynamic too, right? Because I may look at 10 deals to buy before like, I may never buy if I want to buy, but yeah. if I want to sell you're and selling. I've got a good, I'm selling and you're, you're selling. and you're the, you're representing me. And it's a lot of fun, you know, <laughs> getting, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of sell side engagements. It's a lot about, it's a lot about chemistry, mm -hmm. right? You got to have a lot of chemistry. You're spending a lot of time together. You're getting to know each other. Yep. You're about to go through a roller coaster together. A lot of emotion. There's a lot of subjectivity, mm -hmm. a lot of psychology that goes into it. And so it's a lot of fun when you're getting to know your client really close and then you watch them go through a liquidity event that is by far the largest liquidity event they'll ever have. Yeah. And their station in life has dramatically changed. You know, one of the things we love to do is we go to closing dinners with our with all of our clients. Mm -hmm. And at that closing dinner, we're just we're cheersing and we're high fiving mm -hmm. and we're just celebrating. And it's a lot of that, that moment right there is that's, that's where it's like, this is, this is why it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know? So back to my real estate example, I mentioned my fiance, if she buys a house for somebody, they then have to sell their old house. Yeah. And I thought in your case, it might not be the case, but does a private equity buyer, will they hire the banker that helped them buy it to sell it? Or is it, 
there, there's no not tradition really. of doing that. Okay. No, not, not really, figured. especially yeah. for us. So for us, it's more because we're in lower middle market. It's a lot of selling first generation owners mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, selling their business and then we sell them off to a fund mm -hmm. and then they typically net, we lose the relationship after that. Typically okay. we'll stay in touch with our client because our client will, you know, they may have a little bit of exclusive, um, uh, uh, non-compete, excuse me mm -hmm. for two or three years, but they're going to do something again, <laughs> but that you can't non-compete a marketplace. Yeah. And so they'll go start another business and they're like, you know, we have a client right now that actually the, that we sold their business about two years ago the direct to consumer stroller business that mm -hmm. I was talking about earlier, you know, he is now uh, working with us. We started a private equity effort and we started a, a company with him. He mm -hmm. came back to us. I have an idea. I've got suppliers. I've got all the, you know, logistics resources, et cetera. And we said, Hey, we know how to market this thing online. We have all the resources. It's completely outsourced and it's launching next month. You mm -hmm. know, it's uh, so, so we'll have those types of relationships, but um, yeah, typically it's, it's sold and then yep. yeah, done. <laughs> so, You've talked a little bit about this, but where do you think the biggest op opportunities are right now due to COVID? In your sp in, in, in your world, at least. Gosh, in our world, it's uh, it, it's it's e-commerce. There's no questions asked. I mean, the amount of eyeballs that are on Amazon right now is is the the most and largest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you know, if you're a consumer products company um, and you're been traditionally brick and mortar. Uh, right now getting online is a very easy number mm -hmm. one. Um, and number two, it's, it's where you're going to see majority of your growth, you know? Yeah. And I think barrier of entry, there's, there's more competitive pressure that's coming on to the marketplaces. There's more competitive pressure out there when it comes to marketing your brand through Facebook, through Google, et cetera, but it's never been easier to do it. You and I could sit here uh, finish drinking our, our, uh, our rye whiskey, our angels envy. That's, That's a right. goddamn good rye whiskey. That is cheers, man. That is actually, I'm not, I'm not a whiskey guy, but this is good. Um, within 20 minutes, you and I could start a Shopify site and start mm -hmm. selling product. I've seen it. One of, one of, um, my former coworkers, his wife, really artistic. She started making these beautiful tables where she'd go reclaim wood from just local businesses. And she'd, she'd get, she'd, get their wood and she'd stain it and then she'd turn around and sell it. It was like $150,000 a year business on Instagram. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me. And it, there, there's no staff that you have to do, you know, there, it, it, the, the, the opportunities to do that type of thing are, are amazing. There's a lot of side hustles. I think yeah. that's, 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 that's the biggest opportunity. But the question is where right do now. those side hustles become scalable businesses? Cause 150 K I know, is I know where you're living to make, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it's, there's, there's a difference, right? And there, and to me, can you create a lifestyle business that becomes one of the $4 million EBITDA businesses you that you're talking about? I mean, most of our clients, they started off where they did not think they were just doing it to make an extra, mm -hmm. you know, hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year or less, really. Mm -hmm. um, let me just pay some bills. Let me pay my mortgage. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're able to pay off their house. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, the growth was so large, they're hitting two, three, four. Yep. Well, now you've got brand, now you've got staying power. Yep. And now you've got a real EBITDA that real investors, real, real sophisticated acquirers will take a look at. Now all of a sudden, you know, you went from let me just pay my mortgage to I paid off my house to yep. now I'm about to get a check for twenty five, thirty million dollars. A generational wealth event. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So what's the inflection point? I think it starts with, you know, it really does depend on the product. You know, there's a whole lot of nuance in that. You've got to find category a good category, category with a lot of white space, with a lot of um, you know, what's the, what's we call it the TAM total addressable market, mm -hmm. you know, and how large, how large is that market? What's that size look like? You, if you really want to be a real brand, you got to still do real, yeah. you know, I'd say traditional kind of business, um, you know, uh, research. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and to me, that is the difference when it comes to clients, even the clients, the, a client that I just kind of walked you through someone who said, Hey, let me make this a side hustle. Well, mm -hmm. the business started seeing really, really good growth. And once it started seeing really good growth, they said, okay, well, let me actually apply real like business strategy to this. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of hit a next click a next iteration and et cetera, et cetera. So. That, that, that's really cool. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Yeah, and man. I don't know if I'm going to articulate this the right way, but are there technology trends in investment banking itself that are shaking up the space at all? I don't mean for your clients, but I mean for, for the actual investment banks. For banks, yeah, that, where they can gain a competitive advantage. Because it seems like a, 
technologically, I don't want to say backwards, but it, it's not very leveraged on technology. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not at all. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I've, I've always thought that maybe there's some AI where you can automate some of that research and it's a robot doing it instead of some kid out of uh, <laughs> Keenan Flagler. <laughs> yeah, we actually have one of those in our okay. office. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, the way it was described to me by Chris Rossbrook, who used to be an investment banker at Edgeview and, and has since gone on to map anything and then um, Ecos, he thought that the problem was in, in most businesses, there's somebody who can raise their hand and say, I can improve my operations through technology. And yeah. he felt like because of the deal structure and the partner structure, it was just hard to find a buyer for technology. And if you can't find a buyer, you can't sell to them. Yeah. I mean, look, I think you can, every good firm has great process. Mm -hmm. And I think you can probably focus in on the process and you can innovate the process and you can make it faster, more efficient. You know, could you apply some AI? Probably, you know, can you invest in some technology to make that a faster, a faster process, but you're still dealing with people Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you'll just never get away from people, yeah. right? You own a business, you have a psychology behind who you are. You know exactly what you're looking for out of a deal. Yep. You know, I'm representing you you know how this works. A lot of it's almost like poker in some ways, yeah. you know? So there's a lot of just high touch, lots of psychology that just can't get ripped away from the sell side engagements. Mm -hmm. It's really tough to replace any of that. So I think again, when it comes to process, making things faster, making things more efficient, sure. You can find, you know, I just spoke to somebody yesterday out of San Francisco who was pitching me on a, a CRM for investment banking and private equity, mm -hmm. right? Very intriguing actually probably going to look into it for the buy for, for actual, uh, for the transaction side, not so much for BD. Um, but it will make us more efficient. It'll make us more organized. It'll make us a little bit faster, but that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what mistakes do you see your clients make early in their formation that come back to bite them at sell time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, see, we typically get... A, is, it, is it cap chart? Because I always hear that cap chart management is a big one. And you you mentioned Carta in a yeah. pre-conversation that we had. But are, are there mistakes that you commonly see that, like, I didn't think about that. Oh, no. No, I mean, I guess in our world, not so much. Okay. You know, because, you know, in the world that you come from, mm -hmm. you know, in software, there's a lot of cap raises. You know, there's a lot of... And a lot of employees. And a lot of employees, <laughs> lots of seed rounds, and et yeah. cetera. And in consumer products, they just don't have that. Most of the businesses that we sell are either one guy, two guys, maybe three guys, and that's it. So you don't really have a whole lot of, call it cap table disorganization. Mm -hmm. It's pretty straightforward. What about the other angle that strikes me is a lot of these are four-hour work week businesses, mm -hmm. as, you, as you've described. Are there things that they do that make them have to stick around for longer than they might otherwise need to or, yeah. do, or do the buyers not really care uh, some buyers don't care but you know one of the things that they don't do they don't they don't have any sops um you know there's no um process mapping at mm -hmm. all uh disorganization when it comes to their financials yeah but we do a lot of cleanup when it comes to their financials you know we mm -hmm. spend a lot of time digging into all their data they don't know their data mm -hmm. they just don't really understand their metrics very well yeah. And these are important things to know and to understand because, you know, look, we're going to quarterback the process, but by the time you're getting on management calls, you got to know your numbers, man. Yeah. Because these guys, you know, you know, the type of, you know, the type of buyers, private equity guys, they're, sh they're, they're nice guys, but they're sharky <laughs> and they're, they're, asking, they're looking for anything that's wrong. Any all. that's right. Yeah. And the minute they find something wrong, it's like pulling a thread on a sweater. Yeah. And so you've got to really understand your num numbers. You got to understand your data. And that's typically in these kind of first generation guys, they've grown the business so fast and furious that they've just kind of, they've effectively neglected that. So I'd say that's, that's something that tends to bite them, but that's, <laughs> it just makes that's our job, job. it <laughs> makes our job harder, honestly. <laughs> so speaking of your job, what's a typical fee um, 
for, for a sell side deal? Like what's the structure of yeah. a fee? What is that? And, and you don't have to go into details if sure. they're proprietary, but just so folks understand no. what you pay a banker. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit different in the sense of, you know, a middle market investment bank is going to charge somewhere between 50, 75,000 or a hundred thousand upfront. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the type of folks that we're working with, that's just out of the question. And so we typically charge a much smaller upfront, usually about ten, a tenth of that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're charging, you know, call it anywhere between seventy five hundred to twenty five thousand dollars up front, the very, very most. And but that's not a monthly fee. That's it's only a one time fee. We're not going to charge you for the whiskey that we drank while talking to you and the coffee that we decide that we smelled and we looked at while talking <laughs> to you. Um, it's a one time fee. And if we have to come visit you, we'll pay for all of our expenses. And really what we do, though, is we spend a lot of time with you to vet mm -hmm. your company. And we give a probability weighted average on the outcome. Mm -hmm. And if it's higher than 90%, then we're going to feel very confident handing you an engagement letter. So we're going to feel really confident saying, hey, we want to get rewarded when you get rewarded. Mm -hmm. And so, so success fee. It's, it, right. So our success fee typically looks like a, a double Lehman. Mm -hmm. So the higher the enterprise value, then the lower our success fee. But what's interesting is if I laid out the past 10 engagement letters for you, every single one looks different. Mm -hmm. And it's for a reason because you may have some different um, incentives and some motivation than the other guy. So you might, you know, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but say half of those honestly are guys who go, Hey man, if you can get me past this number, then I'm going to, it's almost like a hedge fund. Yeah. I'm going to reward you handsomely. Well, it's, it's not a two and 20, but it's almost like a two and 20. Like, <laughs> I, I have a base fee and then I have, yeah. if I make you money. <laughs> well, yeah. And so they're the ones kind of driving that whole okay. conversation, which is great. And we're, and you know, again, it just depends on how confident we feel about the multiple and about the EV and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, it's very customized, but one things we one of the things we do pride ourselves on is we love just working with our customer mm -hmm. and coming to a really strong alignment prior to going to market market. Do you get much questions around carve out? Because that seems like a thing where like I've already been called by three people mm -hmm. and, and, and we I don't do. want to pay you for that. And yeah. <laughs> and we go, OK, go talk to those three people and come back to us. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a great answer, yeah. by the way. <laughs> See if you can get a deal done with those three people and then to come talk to us. Yeah. But usually what we, we, we walk them through some really good rationale and say, look, you you want those three in the mix of the 400 we're going to go talk to. And even if you do a deal with those three, it's going to be higher because these others that be we brought to the table exactly. have driven the price up. That's yeah. exactly right. So, but that, yeah, we do get that a lot. So I'm, I'm a founder. I'm sitting here going, what the fuck? I'm making 4 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody mentions to me, I want to hire a banker. Yeah. I should start a process. What, what advice do you have for that founder? Not, wow. and, and not and not yeah. putting on your global yeah <laughs> you're, you're, you're but but like if you're if you're advising your friend your yeah. fraternity brother and you're like hey look this That's is right. what i think you need to think about right now i would say engage a and try and engage some some level of expertise within your own niche right mm -hmm. maybe not go to goldman or jp morgan if you're at four million dollars <laughs> yeah. but engage somebody who's in your space if you're a if you're an e-commerce um, concentrated consumer products business, go find someone maybe like us just to start having conversations mm -hmm. and understand, okay, well, what are your goals? Right? Cause that's what we usually start with. What mm -hmm. are, what are your, what are you trying to get out of this whole thing? Mm -hmm. So here's your goals, right? Here's where you are today. And what will the capital markets think about all this? That's the intersection. And you want to try and find someone who can really clearly paint that picture for you. Mm -hmm. Now, Again, I won't plug ourselves, but <laughs> we love doing that. You know, yeah. we love doing even we've done this with lots of clients where we do a time series analysis and say, you're here today. If you get here by this time, this is where you're going to, this is, this is where you're probably going to trade. This is where deal structures, structures probably going to come in. And oh, by the way, here's how you need to get there. We start talking about functions of the mm -hmm. business. And that's why part of, part of the conversation we had about just partnerships and, and et cetera, it was more than just referral. It's about just being resourceful, right? You came to me, if you came to me tomorrow and said, Hey, I own a very successful consumer products company, but I'm having, I'm actually struggling with my a costs <laughs> on Amazon, right? My advertising cost of sales. I'd say, I've got someone just for you. Here's actually three people. So you're playing the long game. You're investing always. Actually, so that's going to drive a bigger fee for you. Yeah. I talked to a guy today, a uh, mattress guy, um, and you know, $60 million top line. 
and um, really nice business. It's a resale business. Um, so he sells all types of mattresses, has several stores actually up in, uh, in the Midwest. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> we told him, hey, man, here's where you're at. Here's where, where we think you should go. We think you should wait. His first comment was, I can't believe you told me to wait. Hmm. It's yeah. like, but this is how we feel. Yeah. Like <laughs> this is our analysis. And he's just, he said it like three times to us. He's like, I can't just, I can't believe you told me to wait, man. It's like, yeah, that's what professional services do. Yeah. <laughs> We're not predatory, man. Yeah, like yeah. you don't need to sign an engagement letter tomorrow. We're not about volume, right? We're not lawyers who are going to charge you for every six minute phone. Yes, call. Yeah. that's right. In fact, I might retroactivate this entire call, but whatever. So yeah, we do play the long game a lot. Very cool. Yeah. So you know, we haven't talked a lot about this, but I'm curious your take or, or do you, and it sounds like most of your buyers are strategic, but can you talk about the difference between a strategic and a financial sponsor? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the way that we kind of separate the, the wheat and the chaff, um, in our world, um, playing in the lower middle market, um, you know, there's a whole separate conversation of how lots of different, uh, venture, venture debt funds have actually, um, come up recently, they've, they've raised close to about $4 billion only to buy Amazon businesses and e-commerce businesses. So that's wow. kind of one group. We can talk a little bit more in detail later. Um, then you have the traditional funded sponsors, um, which are their private equity firms, your family offices, mm -hmm. and then you have your corporate strategic. So funded sponsors, um, private equity, family offices, they're in the business of doing acquisitions, right? So typically they raise a fund, you have a bunch of LPs, you have a GP, and there's a strategy to the fund, right? We wanna find a cornerstone deal or a platform deal, and then whatever that cornerstone and platform is, we're just wanting to tuck in different acquisitions into that. Build mm -hmm. it up three to five years, we wanna sell it. So they love retaining risk in the, in the, in the form of, uh, of equity role, mm -hmm. right? Then you have corporate strategics. They don't do a lot of deals, but they see the world a lot different which is good. It's good news. So if you have something at corporate strategic, they might want, spend a little more money. <laughs> they, they do. It's wonderful. Cause it's not their money. <laughs> That's right. And so the corporate strategics, what they do is they, they look at things and go, okay, this would be a great tuck in for us. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you see all of this OPEX that goes away once we buy it. So we're actually modeling things a lot different. See, I, I always tell people like, I, I feel like overhead, if you're, if you have a strategic buyer, your overhead almost doesn't matter because your overhead becomes the strategic buyers. Overhead, exactly. Right? Yeah, That's yeah. exactly right. That's yeah. exactly what it is. And so that modeling looks different, but with traditional funded sponsors, they're buying the business. And mm -hmm. so they've got to look at the OPEX. And so EBITDA really matters at that point, mm -hmm. but on a more corporate strategic level, sure. They're looking at EBITDA, but they're really looking at more how More can I scale gross, this business? It's yeah. gross margin. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's this, what's this widget that this brand is selling or this, you know, the, the, the portfolio of widgets, mm -hmm. you know, how much, how much can I a scale this, but how much also grow, how much gross margin is actually being yep. made here. And so that's typically where they, they play. So. Got it. So this is a tough one. I'd like to talk about valuation. Can, <laughs> can, you, can you walk the listeners through how you, how, how, throughout your process, how do you establish a valuation, which obviously, or maybe you don't, uh, you know, yeah. there's a lot of variables, but how do you start to talk about a founder who's got a great life doing this thing yeah. and, and maybe cares about valuation, maybe doesn't, but says, well, what are we going to sell this for? Well, the good news is we are not 409A guys. <laughs> And so, you know, we've got a little bit more kind of on the ground in the weeds experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we start talking to you about your business in terms of valuation, um, we get our hands dirty around as much data as you can give us. Mm -hmm. And we're going to analyze all that data. And once we've done our analysis, we're going to do a lot of market comp, mm -hmm. right? And the way that we like to talk about valuation is in range. Because we talk about, okay, your business in particular, with the growth trajectory, with the EBITDA that you have, with uh, the moat that you have, you're a private label brand, you've got lots of really great talking points. The, va the, the type of buyers we're gonna take you to is X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we believe the valuation range yeah. is gonna come in at a you know six to 10 multiple. And when you think of six to 10, I, I take it because you, you think in 
in EBITDA is what you Correct. you've said. So it's a six to ten x on on EBITDA is what you're. But I, I know that you're you're saying that that might be in a, a sample range. It may be different right. for different companies. Yeah, that's exactly right. But you know the difference between the software world, mm-hmm. which is typically done on revenue, yeah. versus consumer products is cogs, yeah. cost of goods sold. Because we have that COGS, con- COGS component, it's always done on EBITDA. Got it. And so, you know, we'll give a range and then we'll start talking about, hey, here are the deal structures you should get comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are you comfortable with rolling equity? Yes. How much? Up to 30. Great. Um, how comfortable are you with earnout? Mm-hmm. Um, comfortable. Great. So we start kind of talking through the different deal structures that could happen. And really in the process, what we're doing is we're really gauging our, our client on where they may go in terms of total deal structure. But some clients are very straightforward. Nope, full buyout, that's it. Yeah. I'm walking away, I don't want to retain anything, great. Well, we're going to go out there and make sure <laughs> they understand that they understand buying. these guys are gone, man. Yeah, yeah. It's over. It's done. <laughs> so, so yeah, this, when we talk about valuation, you know, we don't stamp a number on anything. Right. Yeah. And in the lower middle market, the reason why I even say that is because as we were talking about business brokers earlier, business brokers will handcuff you to a price. Mm-hmm. They'll say, Hey, you have $500,000 of seller discretionary earnings. This is a three multiple. We're going to take it out to at 1.5, you know, so we don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because our process is is wildly different. And because of that, we have to talk in range because by the way, the capital markets are going to speak. They're very rewarding and they're very harsh at the same time. (laughs) Well, yeah, I I may want to sell my house at a certain level, but if I want to sell my house, I may also sell it at a different level. (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) That's exactly right. So, so, have you ever seen where sellers say this is the price and I'm do, like, do you ever go out to, to market and say, this is what they want? Or to me, that feels like I'm, I'd be leaving money on the table, but like on the investment side, when, when I invest in early stage companies, I see a, some investors come to me and say, this is the value of my company and you yeah. can invest in it or not. Can you do that on the sell side not, or is it risky? Typically what we find with, with owners, uh, with sellers is they'll say, um, I won't accept anything, anything less than X. Mm-hmm. That's usually where we find kind of the number. It's not more like, go get me at, go get me why. But do you, would you ever suggest that they publish that? <laughs> or no, or communicate that you you would say let me because I'm I'm at again I've mentioned that I've worked with Hyder Harris on a few deals yeah. and his his take has always been, hey that's your job, <laughs> you know like we we've got thoughts on valuation and we can help you think about we, it. We say the same thing. Yeah. We say the same thing. We give get, we give valuation <laughs> guidance. Yeah, exactly. We put the guardrails up and say, hey man, if you come with to us with this deal structure, we're just gonna you're laugh. Gonna, yeah, you're gonna insult that's right. me. That's yeah. right. And you know, we'll never speak to you again. It's totally fine. But yeah. no, it's it's we'll give guidance, we'll give some guardrails, we'll put some guardrails on it, but that's a, that's about it. So very cool. Um so I, I mentioned buying a house and buy, buying or selling a house and buying or selling a business. Do you think there are any analogies between them or are they just such different beasts? <laughs> Great question. I would say, you know, I was talking to, I was talking to a good friend of, uh, of mine, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's a middle market, uh, investment banker, um, and uh, COO of actually this investment bank. And, um, you know, we were just joking. He goes, you know, my friends always ask me for stock advice and I'm like, yeah, that's typically true. They don't understand investment banking versus. I, I get asked a lot to <laughs> hook up a fucking printer, and I'm yeah. like, "What do you think I do for a living?" <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah. It's like what? Mm, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how your printer driver <laughs> needs not, to be updated. That's not how that works. <laughs> it's not how. It's like the Geico commercial. That's not how any of this works. Um, and he was joking, and we both were joking. It's like, it's it's a little bit like a glorified real estate agent in some yeah. ways. Um, but I, I think there's a, there's a clear separation. I think, you know, when it comes to, to real estate and, and really there's a separation within real estate agents, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you have, you have the folks who are just, you know, throwing out a price, put on MLS, don't really do a whole lot of work. And, you know, they're just kind of middle of the road. They're kind of like business brokers, mm-hmm. right? And then you've got the real estate agents who have built a strong network of high worth individuals. Um, they've built a strong network of being able to find the right buyer for the house. I, I've, I've seen this firsthand. I, like my, my, my fiance makes a killing in real estate because she brings an army of contractors to every meeting and says, look, this is what we're going to do to your house. This is how we're going to make it worth money. This is what we're going to do. And it, 
it's a completely different experience. And usually, not not to get too sidetracked here, but usually I laugh because the wives are like, yes, this is what we need to do. Yeah. And, and the guys are more like me, like, fuck you. I'm not spending a dollar to sell this <laughs> yeah. house. And I'm and I've seen it work so well when you yeah. do spend the money. But, she, and but you, she's probably yeah, like, yeah, here's yeah. the spreadsheet. Here's what you want to do. You're going to spend this and I'm going to get you X. So yeah. just shut up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sit and down but, and shut up. But, but to me, that's the difference between a banker, it as, is. as you framed it, and a business broker. That's it. Yeah, That's yeah. exactly the difference. So if you're looking at it from a real estate perspective, it's someone who, who looks at the house from a holistic perspective, you know, um, someone who's probably selling more up market, you know, and, 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 and it's a more sophisticated process, yeah. you know, selling a $2 million home is a whole hell of a lot different than selling a $150,000 house Yeah, and different clientele. It's to your point, you're bringing an army of contractors and saying, Hey, look, I just know based on comp, nobody spends two and a half million on a house that needs work done. So you better get all the work done. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to show up to this thing and write a check for two and a half mil and be like, crap. Now I got to spend another mil. Do you, you want it exactly how you want it? Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, it has to be beautiful. Yep. You know, the pictures have to be gorgeous. The video has to be gorgeous. So yeah, it's a little bit more probably like that, a little bit more of an upmarket experience. So very cool. Yeah. So th this, uh, you know, I have no idea what your answer is going to be on this. Um, cause I don't, I haven't even wrapped my head around it yet, but have, do you think the recent change in administrations <laughs> has changed anything for you or your clients? Yet? Cause I, I'm looking at the new tax proposals there you and go. right now the tax proposals are all corporate taxes, which yeah. doesn't change selling a business. It doesn't. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. You know, we actually just had a conversation with a potential client just the other day. Um, you know, corporate taxes, it doesn't matter. They go up irrespective. Yeah. Um, you know, if I sell a business, my corporate tax rate is now 28%. The new buyer, 28%. Capital gains, though, that's yeah. a little bit different. You know, it's it's it can affect my decision on, do I sell my business right now, right? And the conversation recently, as you are probably well-versed, has been <laughs> going from 20 to 39, yeah. right? And that's a that's a that's a big difference. That's a big ass jump, man. I don't care your politics. I've met plenty of people who advocate bigger government who the, the minute they look at capital gains taxes and are like, whoa. Oh, I spoke to somebody <laughs> just yesterday who, you know, I could allude to the fact that they are probably just full Marxist. And when I walked them through capital gains, they were their mind was blown. They became a Trump supporter. They did almost immediately. <laughs> they were like, oh, okay. Now I'm a fiscal conservative. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when when you walk people through that component, that's kind of the one component that really affects our business. Mm -hmm. And it'll just affect sellers going, do I want to sell now? Do I want to wait for a new administration to potentially mm -hmm. change things? Because this last administration changed capital gains. Mm -hmm. Um, this administration wants to change capital gains. I mean, every president who basically has full power from, you know, house to Senate can change whatever they want in the tax code. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's the one kind of Trump card, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do you have a view on expectations for future changes in the coming years? Obviously the last few days we've had some clarity on yeah. some of the initial planning, but I've also heard there's other spending coming and other taxes. I so, read the same yeah. thing. There's another <laughs> another bill, and uh, with that bill, there might be, you know, okay, let's focus on the wealthy, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, I think it's a big question mark. I think a lot of folks are just going, hmm, let's just wait and see. Let's yeah. see what happens. And did, did you see a rush at the end of the last administration for people trying to sell businesses or we saw a rush when the calendar flipped, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, a lot of funds, a lot of funded sponsors, a lot of, um, you know, just a lot of dry powder out there was ready to get to work pretty much in January. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we saw a, a pretty big rush and some of that was driven. We actually had a client in particular, um, the one I told you about earlier with the poll, Oh yeah, yeah. Their decision was driven by, Hey, you know, let's go ahead and, and mitigate our risk mm -hmm. and let's go to market now. That was back in November, uh, September of last year. So let's go to market now. Did so they that get way, the deal done? They did. Okay, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it was done last month. So yeah, it's, it's, they got it done in time to, to, to not even get, you know, grandfathered right. and, in. Well, and how did the tax laws, when, when the tax laws do change, are they retroactive to the year that they're changed or are they from the date that they're changed? I think if, if things go in effect, 2022 mm -hmm. it'll just be january 2022 okay is the way that i read it so that's one thing we always have to caveat is hey don't take tax advice from us yeah, yeah. it's illegal 
But uh, but yeah, that's that's the way we read it. Is it won't be retroactivated? That would I think cause a big stir. Yeah, that, especially going into midterms. Yeah, that would be problematic. So. Yeah. Well, look, Chris, this has been amazing. I'm so glad that you came uh, to visit me and uh, and and do this interview, and it, and especially the fact that you bought brought. brought Brian, who is now helping us do the switching on our video. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thanks, dude. Shout out to Brian. That's right, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this has been great. I really appreciate the time, man. All right. Cheers. Yeah, thanks. It was awesome, dude. That was fun, man.